Combined with the 336 field artillery who supported them, they usually stayed within three miles of the regiment. And we also added the 335th field artillery. They had a larger weapon and they, and they um, provided general support for the whole division. So uh, Jim Ogden, his father was in L Company, 346. He's 3rd Battalion historian as well. And he's here with us. This is his son, Jim Ogden, and he's going to give this presentation. Thank you, Barbara. As Barbara said, I was asked to uh, do the presentation for the 346th Infantry and the, uh, the artillery that was normally attached to it, the, uh, the 336th Field Artillery Battalion. Um, and as we'll see in, in just a moment, uh, we also include just a little bit here of the 335th, the more general support ba uh, battalion of the division, uh, having the, uh, the larger weapon. Um, the, uh, it particularly um, being assigned to fire uh, for specific missions based on uh, what each one of the regiments were doing. Um, a similar timeline to what uh, Jim included in, um, in his presentation uh, earlier with the, uh, the beginning of World War II in 1939, the United States entering it in December of 1941, and of course in um, uh, late 42, the 87th is uh, is, cre is activated, um, and then will arrive in Europe in November of, uh, of 1944. Uh, the 346 um, uh, regiment has a distinctive um, uh, crest, um, uh, always and everywhere faithful. Its motto in Latin on the um, on the scroll here across the uh, bottom. bottom. Um, the cotton bowl included on the, uh, the, the crest uh, and uh, also the acorn. The cotton bowl um, included when uh, the division was originally created, or the regiment was originally created as part of the division in World War I when it was more southern outfit. But as some of you all have, uh, have noted, it had a very distinctive northern uh, or northeastern flavor um, in, in World War II. Uh, a similar structure to the uh, the 345th, uh, as Jim explained, uh, the regiment divided into uh, to three battalions, each one of the battalions having three rifle companies and one uh, heavy weapons company. And then within each one of the companies, uh, three platoons, uh, of three rifle platoons, each with three squads, and then a fourth platoon in the company uh, being the weapons platoon with the air-cooled 30 caliber machine guns and the 60 millimeter mortars. And this image that uh, uh, Jim used as well, uh, it, uh, he's, as he said yesterday, if you count carefully with a magnifying glass, you've got a hundred and uh, a few guys in view in this. So this is uh, basically a column company um, and um, it's moving up to the Moselle uh, River. To Copelands. Uh, moving up to Copelands after the crossing at Moselle. Yeah. And for the, uh, the 336 Field Artillery Battalion, it um, was made up of three batteries of the 105 millimeter howitzers, four um, guns in each one of the howitzers, with four men uh, on the crew right at the gun. The gun had a range of seven miles, and as has been noted, uh, the uh, battery attempted to stay within about three miles of the, uh, the regiment. That, of course, varied at, uh, at different times. There are uh, instances, uh, particularly in the fighting in the, uh, the Siegfried line, where the, uh, the batteries were, at least for a time, a lot closer to the front line than, uh, than that. Um, and then they also have the challenge in the drive across um, uh, central Germany in April of uh, 1945, uh, the speed being so great of just keeping up and being able to, uh, to be able to uh, drop trail and deploy and fire if there were a need um, to. There's the uh, 105 howitzer towed by, uh, by the truck. The 335th Field Artillery Battalion 
had a similar structure, three firing batteries, uh, each one of the batteries again having four guns. And, uh, the, this battalion though was armed with larger guns, 155 millimeter howitzer, and had a greater range, a range of about 10 miles, and it was intended more as a general support battery uh, for the division to apply uh, additional firepower, artillery firepower, on particular targets depending upon what the main effort was or where the uh, need might be the greatest uh, at that time. Um, this battery uh, might one day be supporting mostly the 345th, the next day it might support the 346, just depending upon what the division main effort was at that particular moment. Uh, additionally, depending upon the uh, focus of actions within the Corps, additional artillery battalions that were assigned at the Corps um, and even Army level might be assigned to supplement the fires as well. And uh, depending upon the, the situation, you might get fire support from the uh, division next to the left or right of where uh, the 87th was fighting. Uh, the 87th's um, basic timeline um, will uh, will leave the uh, the United States and uh, and move to uh, to England, um, and then on uh, November 27th and 28th, the uh, division will leave England and cross the uh, English Channel and land at uh, La Havre, uh, France, and then will be moved uh, across France down into the uh, the Saar region of Germany, as we'll see. And of course, the major campaigns, the action in the Battle of the Bulge, uh, the time they spend down in uh, Luxembourg, the uh, movement up to the main defenses in the Siegfried Line, and then the fight through the Siegfried Line, the move up to and the crossing of the Moselle River, and the seizure of the Blentz, and then the crossing of the Rhine River, and then that drive across Germany uh, to then uh, have the war end for, uh, for the guys in the division on the 7th of May with the 8th of May being declared the E day. Uh, this graphic shows the, uh, the movement of the division landing at, uh, at La Havre and then traveling by the, uh, the famous 48, 40 and 8 boxcars, 40 men or 8 horses. Uh, you saw in, uh, in the news coverage of one of the reunions that Jim held in, uh, in Huntsville, you saw the 40 and 8 boxcar that was there. Uh, so boxcars like that, not quite as gaily painted, no, but, uh, uh, but that, the, the men traveled um, that route. Some of the equipment did go part of the way up the Seine River before then uh, moving on over to the, uh, to the Mets area. And with the 345th uh, discussion, we heard uh, about the, uh, the division's uh, first actions in the Metz area, containing some of the last German forts uh, in Metz and, um, and shelling them, the, uh, the artillery of the division being some of the very first uh, men in, in the division to be able to say they actually were in, uh, in combat. Um, and uh, the, uh, encouraging the, um, the, the Germans in those forts to um, uh, to, to surrender, and we heard one um, interesting story about how, um, how some of them were, uh, were encouraged to do that and how they expected to, uh, to I guess, be taking a, a grand tour after that. So, uh, um, and after uh, several days in the, uh, in the Mets area, on the 9th of December, the division, uh, the regiment, the 346th, along with the division, will move um, from the Metz area down into the, uh, to the Saar, with the 346th in particular going to Kalhausen. Um, and uh, this uh, movement at a distance of 47 miles would be by, uh, by truck and jeep, by uh, motor vehicle, um, down to what's uh, now be ready to, to go into combat itself. And the division and the regiment will see its first combat in the um, Saar region of Germany between the 11th and 24th of December, particularly around the towns of uh, Rimling, um, uh, Riederkirch, uh, and Etching. Uh, and on this map of, um, uh, of the area, the this, um, uh, the red box here shows the initial movement of, um, of the 346th in their initial assault on December the 11th. Um, and um, 
actually crossing the German border, the yellow line right here, and crossing into Germany. They were then relieved by the, uh, the 345th, uh, as Jim has, uh, has mentioned, with the idea with the triangular division was that typically the division would fight with two regiments up and one regiment in reserve, um, and that would then allow for a rotating of the units um, to, uh, based on the, the mission and, um, and uh, combat losses. So after a couple of days in, uh, in action, the 346th would be relieved by the 345th, um, and the 346th would serve time in division reserve in the area of Rimling. Uh, and then, as a result of the uh, German Ardennes offensive having begun on December 16th, and the realization by Eisenhower, Bradley, and Patton of the seriousness of that um, offensive, steps began to be taken to get uh, additional troops to deal with the German offensive, and the uh, 87th Division will be one of those that is identified for that, uh, that potential role in the Ardennes, and they begin to consolidate positions here in the, uh, the Saar region, um, and the, uh, the 346 will spend a couple of, a couple of days um, in defensive positions around Obergailbach, Niedergailbach, and Bleesbrook, and then we'll, um, we'll be pulled back further. Again, picture of a destroyed German armored vehicle in uh, Gross Rediching, another destroyed German vehicle, and some of the terrain in that Saar region of Germany, hills and woods and the villages. And here, the withdrawal of the division uh, from their forward positions back into, uh, into reserve. And as Jim noted, when this occurs, the uh, troops who were taking the 87th uh, position were not put into the same front line or forward position. The line was being shortened and straightened out some to reduce the number of troops necessary in this sector so as to free up troops like the 87th to then be moved against the, uh, the German Ardennes offensive. The time in the SAR had been uh, uh, quite difficult. It was their first uh, combat um, actions, but also um, the, it was their first real experience of operating in such a cold and wet uh, environment. And there were some notable impacts on the, uh, the, three, or on the 87th Division as a whole um, from, uh, from cold injuries, trench foot and uh, a little bit of uh, frostbite. This graph uh, shows some of uh, that effect across the, uh, the bottom here. This lowest um, line represents the uh, cold injuries of the 345th uh, Regiment. This next line up is the 347th, but this tallest line is the, uh, the 346th. Uh, the 346 was particularly hard hit by the effects of some of the cold-related injuries, and even within the 346, the, um, those effects were felt more in one battalion than another. The 3rd Battalion is the lowest line, the 2nd Battalion is the, uh, the next higher one, and 1st Battalion um, suffered greatest from the, uh, the effects of those cold, cold injuries. And there are a number of, um, of A Company guys, 1st uh, Battalion guys here uh, this uh, weekend uh, who have um, some first-hand experience with, um, in, with just exactly how bad that was within the 1st uh, Battalion. This also results, um, as the division gets the, the mission of going up and supporting the, um, or uh, participating in the effort to stop the German offensive in the, uh, the Ardennes, uh, this also results in the division having to shift some uh, personnel around and within the 346, the 3rd Battalion um, has men transferred from its companies to the 1st Battalion to, their, uh, to basically even out the strength of all of the rifle companies for that next expected uh, offensive. And that, of course, is the fight in the, uh, the, uh, against the, uh, the Germans uh, in the Bulge. Um, and uh, for the 346, uh, really involves December 30th through January 13th, 
around the towns of St. Hubert, Baskerville, Jeremiah, and Tillet, um, all little places. Uh, well, this map shows the movement of the troops out of the Saar region, and then to Reims, and then up towards Baston. And uh, here's the, uh, the graph, or the chart again, of the German Ardennes offensive, where the 87th is going to be committed uh, against this uh, German thrust is against the southern shoulder uh, of it just to the west of the Bastogne area. Uh, other troops of Patton's third army are attacking um, to, the, uh, to the east and trying to, uh, to drive the Germans back and relieve Bastogne. Uh, the 87th will attack just to the west along with some additional troops uh, in that area and that's where um, the, uh, these little towns of St. Hubert, and Jeremont, and Tillet are going to be located. And on this map, we've got St. Hubert, uh, Baskerville, um, and Tillet here. And one of the um, heavy weapons um, company positions, um, this is H Company uh, in the, uh, the woods near uh, St. Hubert. Um, for the, uh, the 346, some of its most intense a action in, uh, in this phase, particularly for 3rd Battalion, is for control of the, uh, the little town of Tillet, uh, a little hilltop town, but a town dominated by, uh, by several taller hills right close by and along a, um, a particular um, supply route that was important to the, uh, the German efforts in the area. Uh, this map was, uh, was produced at the time showing the, uh, the general effort of the uh, 346th and particularly the 3rd Battalion at attempting to attack Delay. The town itself is, uh, is right here in the map and initially the attack is going to come in from uh, basically the south trying to get into the town but the Germans uh, are going to be successful at defeating that uh, effort and subsequently um, an effort will be made by L Company to, uh, to swing around to the east and attack from the, uh, from the northeast. Uh, that effort too was unsuccessful, but after um, five days of fighting, eventually Tillet will be uh, occupied. There's an aerial photograph of, uh, of Tillet showing the general axes of attack of the three rifle companies of the 3rd Battalion against the, uh, the town. The, you can see there are woods here on, uh, on higher ground to the west, but you can also see all of the open ground around and with the Germans in the, uh, in the town to fortify fire from, uh, from higher points uh, to the uh, north, northwest, and northeast made it very difficult for the 3rd um, uh, Battalion men to, uh, to make much headway and get into uh, the town. Some of the troops being pinned down out here in this open area for uh, more than 24 hours um, at one point. And it was during this fight for Tillet that the uh, 87th uh, Division will, uh, it's, it, it's one member who will be awarded the Medal of Honor, uh, that he will perform uh, the, uh, the duty that, uh, or the action that won him that medal. Um, Staff Sergeant Curtis F. Shoot. Um, of I Company. Uh, the citation reads, on the 7th of January 1945, on the outskirts of the village of Tillet, Belgium, Staff Sergeant Shoup distinguished himself by the following act of heroism above and beyond the call of duty. Company I was occupying the sides of the hill uh, on the approaches of the town. The enemy had a machine gun placed so as to cover this position and was pinning the company down. The casualty rate was very heavy, and, and unless the machine gun nest was eliminated, the whole company was faced with annihilation. Then enemy mortars and 88 shells began to fall all around. Staff Sergeant Shoup, a BAR man, crawled up to within 75 yards of the uh, machine gun and tried to destroy it. Seeing that he couldn't do this from the position, he stood up and firing the BAR from the waist advanced towards the nest with total disregard of his own life and or personal safety. Bullets were hitting all around him and shell fragments filled the air near him. He was hit several times and was finally knocked down by enemy fire. Although seriously wounded, he struggled to his feet and continued to advance until he was close enough to throw a grenade and destroy the nest. 
by his courageous and unselfish act of bravery, he would not only save the lives of over 60 men, but he permitted the company to advance and to attain its objective. Right after knocking out the machine gun nest, so Staff Sergeant Shu, uh, it doesn't say here, but another account of the incident uh, says that after knocking out that first one, he began crawling towards the second one. Uh, and, but as he was doing that, uh, Sergeant Shu was fatally hit by a bullet, um, fired, uh, or would, and died uh, in that effort. There's a moderate view of, of delay. Mr. Moore, I think you could uh, you can tell us a little more about the, uh, the the modern view of the village as well. And then, after the uh, the action in um, uh, around Tulay, the uh, 346 along with the 87th will be uh, relieved, uh, and they will be sent down into Luxembourg and take over positions of the Fourth Infantry down along the Sauer River. And um, uh, the, um, uh, this is kind of down where, um, uh, where the German bulge uh, begins, where it uh, starts to push out to the, uh, to the west. Um, and on this map, you can see moving here from just west of, uh, of Bastogne, moving into Luxembourg, and then down almost to the, uh, to the German border um, right here in the area of Echternach and Wasserbillig. Modern view, looking across the uh, the river um, to, uh, to Germany, and this is one of the uh, the, the towns where there are uh, plaques today to the uh, to the 87th uh, Infantry Division. I can't read the top one for you. Uh, the bottom one says, "In honor of uh, in honor to the valiant valiant soldiers uh, of the 87th U.S. Infantry Division who liberated Wasabilly." on January uh, 23rd, 1945. What river was that? The Sauer. The Sauer. Pretty um, big river too, right? Yeah. Mitch? Um, it's uh, noteworthy uh, to know that uh, the 87th Division placed most of the blacks after the war for its own heroes and locations Wasserbilling was generated by the local population. They wanted to remember the 87th Division. And when we visited Wasserbilling, they made heroes out of us and that was needless. Yeah, the, uh, the, the top one, um, as I said, I can't read it. Uh, uh, it's obviously one that was produced locally and, uh, and uh, erected there. Uh, but it is it does honor the, uh, the 87th and their liberation of the town. Um, the, uh, and somebody else, uh, the, um, um, the actual um, liberation of the town involved a, um, a, a reinforced uh, patrol um, that, uh, that went into um, uh, Wasabillig and, uh, and took up uh, positions to, uh, to then observe um, German uh, activities in the area. This included a forward observer team from the 336th uh, field artillery, and one of their initial uh, positions was in uh, was in the, uh, the church here, and of course used the church steeple as uh, as their observation point. Eventually, the Germans um, discovered them there. Um, the, uh, the artillery fire uh, and the uh, the German other German fire uh, became enough that eventually they moved to other buildings. Um, including here to, uh, to the, the church next door, or the school next door to the church. And in this uh, relatively modern view, you can still see the pock marks uh, from uh, projectiles that struck the, uh, the building. After um, the time in, um, in Luxembourg, the 346 uh, will move um, out of Luxembourg and, um, and move northward up to the, uh, the St. Vith area, um, and then begin um, to, uh, to turn eastward towards the, uh, the German Siegfried line. Here's a picture of the division motor column on January 30th as they move up towards uh, the St. Vith area. And 
their, uh, their time um, in uh, the uh, first days, uh, the first part of uh, February is pushing up towards the main line of uh, the, uh, the Siegfried line, uh, pushing the Germans back uh, into those, uh, those defensives and preparing for the main offensive against uh, the main part of the German uh, Siegfried line and for the 346th uh, in particular they will be, uh, be uh, directed to, uh, to seize the town of Ormont but also specifically uh, a big open hill which becomes known as Gold, Gold B Hill or Gold Brick Hill for the men of the 346th. Uh, view of the, uh, the Siegfried line and most specifically here this one you can see the line of dragon's teeth um, and on uh, on this uh, graphic you the um, find a number of the towns um, here in the uh, as they push the uh, the Germans back towards uh, the Siegfried line uh, and where the 346 spent time in division reserve before, being, uh, before moving up for the actual main assault towards Ormont, located right here, and Goldberg Hill, located just to the northeast uh, of Ormont and overlooking uh, Ormont. And this uh, period map, terrain map, on here, here's Ormont and Goldberg Hill. There was uh, a lot of detail on here. I know it's uh, very difficult to read, uh, read this as it's pre presented here. But Barbara has this map with her, and it's downstairs if you want to take a closer look at it. Another view of the dragon's teeth. Um, and, of course, the main part of the, um, the <coughs> Siegfried line defenses were the, uh, the pillboxes, which by the time the 346th and the 87th as a whole attacks into this, this area has also been reinforced with a lot of other fighting positions. Uh, roadblocks, abati, there are um, extensive minefields, uh, booby traps, um, and since this was a prepared German defensive position, the, uh, the German artillery had, um, had lots of locations uh, registered. Uh, the German artillery fire uh, was, uh, was quite uh, accurate and extensive, although it was being impacted by, uh, by simply the supply of ammunition but a lot of casualties will come as a result of shell fragments as well. And um, another view of the Siegfried line, the one we saw earlier. Um, and the, um, uh, for the 3rd Battalion of the 346 capturing um, Goldberg Hill, the, the highest part of the hill on uh, March the 3rd would be uh, its most noteworthy um, action a uh, combined infantry and uh, armor assault uh, with a, an extensive artillery uh, preparation ahead of time in which the, uh, the, the 336 uh, as well as the 335th fired um, uh, quite a few rounds for about 20 minutes prior to the infantry assault. Um, once the, um, the, uh, the 346 was through the Siegfried line, they will, uh, will push on towards the, uh, the Moselle River um, and will come into the area of, uh, of Coburn and uh, Winnick, uh, where they will uh, be watching the, the, uh, the crossing sites there. Um, as uh, the 346 did not make one of the assault crossings of the, of the Moselle, uh, they were in support at the time uh, of the other two regiments uh, as the crossings are made, uh, but then the, uh, the 346 itself will cross, and there's a view of ferrying a tank across the Moselle. You can see the high ground as it rises on the other side. And another image of the, uh, the ferrying and bridging operation. And then they'll move up to the, uh, to the Rhine River, uh, into the area of Bopard, and uh, again the 346 will, uh, will be in reserve uh, on the actual day of the crossing, and most specifically the 346 will be uh, uh, in support of the 347 when they cross um, there in the area of Bopard. And again, um, the image of crossing here and a 
as Tom had noted, the, uh, the use of smoke here to obscure the crossing. The 346 will cross the, uh, the day after the assault crossing. And they'll cross in these LCVPs that you see in the picture. Here's another view of the crossings. You can actually see some of the smoke being generated, the LCVPs on the water. Again, this is not uh, uh, the assault crossing. This is the, uh, the day after when the 346 goes over in support. Uh, although the sites were still under German fire. And then, of course, the um, uh, famous pontoon bridge will across the Rhine there. The modern view. And the, uh, the, this is the site where the 3rd Battalion, the 347th, will, uh, will cross. It's in the same area where the 346 also crosses. And then you have the drive across uh, uh, Germany moving towards the uh, westernmost tip of Czechoslovakia, in particular towards the German town of Plauen. And it was, uh, as I noted earlier, a very rapid drive uh, with the uh, German defenses collapsing and uh, the, um, the third and first army trying to keep the pressure on the Germans. Um, aimed towards Plauen, a town that was devastated by, uh, by the aerial bombardment. And here's some 346 guys in Rotowish, just east of Plauen. And uh, into the Falkenstein, they'll be in this area when on May the 7th, uh, the, the war is over. Well, that's the uh, kind of the overview of the, uh, the 346. Uh, I'm going to turn the uh, mic over now to my, uh, my father. Uh, since his, uh, his retirement, he spent a, a lot of time um, researching uh, uh, his company uh, in uh, uh, Company L 346, and uh, he wants to talk a little bit about, uh, just as an example of one rifle company, what happened with them, and um, uh, we've got a handout for you, and I'll, um, I'll get those handed out while he starts. <laughs> Some of you were present yesterday uh, in the presentation. I've heard me uh, say that I, I was not a member of the original Company L. I had been in the Army Air Corps for almost 18 months, and I was transferred to the infantry because the ground forces needed uh, riflemen. And I went over the Seas uh, joined the 87th Division uh, as a replacement, and that was not an experience that I would wish on anybody. Uh, and I think any of you who were, were replacements uh, uh, know what I mean. But I won't go into detail. I thought it might be. It. I've done a lot of research, as a couple of people have said, about the company in which I served, because after I came home and thought about the people I knew, some of whom didn't come back, uh, I thought I ought to find out as much as I could about what the company was like. Actually, I started out by saying I'd do just the third platoon, which was the platoon to which I belong, but uh, found out that it was better to pursue the company at the company level. So the handout, is so I, what I've tried to do is to give you a kind of a thumbnail sketch of what one rifle company in the 87th Division experienced. Now, as has already been said here, there were 27 rifle companies in the 87th Division, nine in each regiment. And in each rifle company, there 
each rifle company, there were three platoons. So if you multiply that out, that means that there were 81 platoons in a total division, and it was at the platoon level that, as Jim pointed out very well, it was at the platoon and squad level where the real action took place, because in World War II, it was boots on the ground taking land that, you know, was the, was the, was the motif for warfare. On the first page that you have, I, I tried to summarize uh, what happened to Company L by date. And I'd just like to point out to you the, the information that I recorded about uh, the various actions and the effect on Company L. If you look at the, the entry for uh, December 9 to 25, I put that, that's a little bit extended beyond what uh, was said earlier about the 11th. Actually, they moved into position on the 9th. They actually went into combat at 9.30, uh, to be precise, at 9.30 on the 11th day of uh, December. But during the period in the SAR, you'll notice that the combat losses for Company L were seven killed, 26 wounded, and one man captured, a Sergeant Beckage, who was reported missing in action on the morning report for months before uh, he, the uh, division was notified about the fact that he was a prisoner of war. Uh, then if you go down to the uh, uh, Siegfried line, uh, well in the Ardennes, I guess the next one would be in the Ardennes, uh, the, the uh, casualties were much lighter. Uh, there, were, there were only five killed and uh, seven wounded and two captured. Actually, one of the wounded was captured uh, uh, but he's carried on this table as wounded. It was a man named Shaw, uh, who uh, was from Pittsburgh, I believe, or the Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh area. And he was, he was seriously wounded on the uh, 8th of January, the day of the, of the L attack on Talay. He was seriously wounded. He was taken to prison and died six days later in a German, uh, in a German hospital. Now that information didn't get back to the states and to his parents until much later. So he was carried, he was just carried as wounded, uh, and then later as missing uh, on the uh, on, on the morning report. And and just as a note, and there's a, a picture on the, uh, the the wall now. Um, he is one of three L Company men killed in uh, um, in action in Europe, whose bodies were returned and are today. Uh, buried just a mile to the north of us in Arlington National he's Cemetery. He's buried at Arlington. Barrett had his, had his remains brought back and he was buried, he was buried at, uh, at Arlington. Now if you go down to the uh, to the uh, Siegfried line uh, 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 notation, January 27th uh, through uh, March, uh, uh, March 6th, actually, by the time it got through the line, that's where Company L suffered a lot of Casualties. Uh, 19 killed uh, and 61, uh, 61 from the uh, from the company. Well, when someone is reported as wounded, does that mean they had to be evacuated back, maybe to? Would it be? Yeah, well, in a few one instances, they went back to the 312th Medical Battalion for a couple of days. Right. But most people, most times when it said wounded. They didn't. They went to the hospital. They went from the, med the medical battalion to the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then I guess the next casualty report, and this is a little bit uh, 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 amazing. If you go down to uh, the march across Germany, March uh, 14th to May 6th, you notice 11 killed and 17 wounded, and eight of those killed were killed on in one night at Sunremde and at Ehrenstein and Sunremde in uh, uh, Germany, and five of uh, six of the eight were from the third platoon. So that was uh, that was a, a rather uh, it was an unusual situation where the where the uh, Germans had I guess decided 
that they were not going to retreat any further that day. And we tried to get into the town riding on tanks, and uh, it, it, was, uh, it was rather bad, uh, as you can imagine. So that's kind of the casualty of this. Now the next page is simply an effort to show what happened to the, to the members of the uh, uh, original company. This happens to be the officers of the original company. Started out with six, six officers, and uh, this shows the distribution. I won't go through the detail of that, but that's the distribution of the office. The next page is the what happened to the original uh, company L, all of the men. There were 190 enlisted men uh, on the roster as of the 11th of December. And this is, this is what happened. Now, over in the very last column, on that page, you have the numbers of the men, the original company men, who were still present on BE Day. So you see, of the 190 who were on roll on the uh, 11th of December, 44, only 44 were present in the company on May 7th or 8th. Uh, uh, now the next table, so you know, the question of course everybody raises is that companies suffered so much, you know, so many casualties, how in the world did it continue to fight? Well, companies continued to fight because they were getting a, a stream of replacements. And sometimes the stream was very weak, but uh, the company got replacements. So on the next page, you have the if the uh, breakout of the uh, officer replacements who came to the company. Ten, ten different officers came into the company as replacements uh, uh, during the combat period. And this is only during the combat period. Were, uh, this is, I'm not talking about the replacements at Jackson or, you know, I'm talking about the replacements after the company went into combat. Now, there are a couple of tragic stories on this page. Uh, for example, the second lieutenant who joined Company L on the 5th of March was killed the next day. So he was only at was a company L. He happened to be the platoon leader of my platoon, the third third platoon, and went up with us. He went up with us, went up to the line the same night that, that, that I went up. And he was killed the next afternoon about 4.30, uh, trying to get into the town of Glad, G-L-A-A-D, uh, Germany. The other story is uh, related to the man who shown coming up on the uh, 14th of January. Uh, he was in Company L just briefly, and then as the note, the footnote says, he, he was killed as a member of Company C, uh, 346. He was the leader of a Tiger Patrol, a very small Tiger Patrol, at the Moselle on the 15th or 16th of uh, uh, March. And they had made their reconnaissance into Koblenz and were on their way back to uh, the uh, American side. And they came under fire and they were all killed. <coughs> he was reported for a long time as missing in action. And Finally, after the war, uh, a body turned up uh, in the river, and there was a thought that it was probably this lieutenant. And the basis for that was that the wallet that was with the body was the lieutenant's wallet. It turned out, after a lot of forensic uh, investigation that the body found was not that of the lieutenant uh, who was missing. His body turned up another couple of months later at another, at another location. And in those days, dental records were the, the means by which bodies were identified. And it was through that means that his body uh, was identified, and his remains were identified. So there are two tragic stories. Uh, the wrong wall. Uh, 
How did the wallet get there? How did the wallet, how did his oh, wallet get on? Oh, nobody knows. It's one of those, you know, it's one of those things uh, in war. How, how, how did somebody's wallet get, get connected with another body? Impossible. <laughs> So did you go up on the on Mar around March the sixth? That was actually when you right. went with that lieutenant that was killed the next day. Yeah, this was a different lieutenant. This was a, uh, this was a different lieutenant. Yeah, I know. That, uh, he but he went. Dad went up on the fifth, the yeah. fifth with the that lieutenant was killed the next day. Okay. On the Mar Can you please uh, repeat the question? Then answer. Pardon? Would you please repeat the question before you answer? Well, the question was when I went up to the company. We well, didn't know back okay. And I went up on the 5th of March to the company. And they were in the town of Kirschenbach. And uh, that's why the lieutenant, the lieutenant went up the same night. Uh, now the next handout is a, is a uh, listing of the, uh, the company, the original company, as I left the front page on it, which is from the official record, which shows the membership of the company the first day of combat, <clears throat> and the blue dots on the, or the black dots on the page, represent those men who were present at the end of the war on May, May 7th. So we can look at each, uh, each uh, page and see who was left from that portion of the company uh, by that uh, by the end of the war. Now the, the next portion of the handout is an analysis of what happened to the, the man in the third platoon of the original company. What I, what I did was to identify the men, uh, identify their position, and then uh, by extracting information from the morning reports to indicate what happened to those, uh, uh, to those men. So that's the next one. It's the third platoon on December 11, uh, 1944. And there are two or three pages of that. Then the next and the next part of the handout is the third platoon on the on the fifth uh, of June, 1945. Now, if you look, there are two pages for that. Uh, or three pages, I'm sorry, the third page has just a, uh, the third page has just a couple of names on it. But if you look behind that, you'll see a rather uh, strange looking sheet. That is a roster of the third platoon, as near as I can determine, on June 5 of 1945. That was, that came from the shirt pocket <laughs> of the of the last platoon leader of the third platoon, now Lieutenant Jack Morphy, who lives in Indiana, and uh, he he knew of my investigations of Company L, and so he was kind enough to send me a copy of that list. Otherwise, there would have been no way that anyone could ever have constructed, reconstructed the third platoon at the end of the war, because the morning reports did not indicate anything about the platoon assignments. Yeah. People were assigned to the company, but nothing about the platoon. So there was no way to reconstruct that. Uh, you're looking at the so, third platoon? Pardon? The third platoon of Company L? Yeah. That was the third platoon of Company L. Yeah. That's an actual copy from the <laughs> platoon leader. And the very last page, I just put in as a kind of a uh, reminder of the fact that names and number that uh, uh, numbers don't really tell any, tell a story. This is a this is just a little biographical sketch uh, of a a typical replacement. I'd say uh, not all replacements, of course, uh, were killed in action, but. Uh, Unfortunately, was killed in that attack on April of, uh, 12, uh, 1945. But it gives you a little bit of a sense of what it was. I learned a lot about him 
because I have all the letters that he wrote home uh, from uh, uh, his, what, his uh, experience in, this, in the military service. I have copies of all, all of those, uh, those letters. So did, I thought did I'd... Did you actually get to know, do you remember getting to know him yeah, while he was there? He was, he was my squad leader at the, at the, at the end of at the end of the war. So I thought that little business about the company and the platoon would be helpful in uh, yeah. uh, bringing uh, it in perspective. Had to get his letters, were they censored or, or did he keep copies of them? Uh, none of the letters that I received uh, has any censorship or marks on it. I'm talking about the letters now that he wrote to his parents. Right. Yeah. Well, I have copies of those, but I don't have, I didn't see any, any letters that had, uh, call it, and I don't call it any letters that had such a short Most of us were kind of careful about, uh, you know, what we wrote, because it was kind of an actress when, when you look, you go back and read many of the letters home, they're, they're kind of say nothing about what's really going on. Uh, you couldn't people, say anything, really. Yeah. People kind of kept that, uh, you know, uh, in their own, uh, in their own heads. Did you want to say anything? Yes. Yeah. There, there are two other men from Company L who are buried in Arlington. There's a, there's a Sergeant Joseph Maley uh, who was uh, uh, killed in the approaches to the Siegfried Line on the 11th. I think he was killed on the 11th of February. 1945, and then Wilfred Hutchins, uh, he's from Massachusetts, uh, somewhere just outside Boston, I believe. Uh, he was killed on the uh, 5th of, uh, of March, 1945, uh, just a after after till after Ormont and Goldbrick Hill, as they were trying to bump up through the Siegfried Line uh, after after the break. So I hope this is. You know, a little bit interesting. Really? Thank you very much for your time. straight up, yeah. yes. uh, that was A346, and there's A346, there's A346, and there's A346, and here's A346. We got off from the harbor on November 28th, and it took us about eight days to get up to where we were going, and I would say within the first 10 to 12 days of that time before the end of December, all four of us had been evacuated with trench foot. I'll tell you how it happened. We were given regular service shoes that we wore in the States. We were given the pair of socks we wore, cushion sewed socks, excellent socks. We were given a spare pair. And we were told, change your shoes every day because they are not waterproof. The frost can go through them and so forth. Take your wet socks, put them under your arms, and dry them out. Well, as you can guess, that didn't do very much. So, I can't tell you the date. I'm going to say it was around the 18th of December that somebody came to the Fox Wars Inn and said, we've got some Arctics. You can go back a quarter of a mile here and under some trees, there's a whole pile of Arctics. So that's when I first picked up some foot protection. Of course, that was too late because we've been through several freeze and thaws and mud, and there was no way at that point that wearing a pair of Arctics was going to help dry your feet out and make it better. On the 28th of December, we've been pulled back, in preparation for the bells, and we were in a field near Reims, I think, and the medics came through to check us over to see if we were able to go. We didn't know for sure where we were headed. We knew we, knew we weren't headed home. So the, the medics came through and had us take our shoes off 
And they looked at our hands. I hadn't had gloves for a few days. My hands were a mess. And they just kind of pointed to you. And, and that was it. You were on your way. I was fortunate. I had around a 10 minute walk to an ambulance. And a one hour drive in the ambulance is on a plane. And I was in England for supper. And I was in England for six or eight weeks. So that is my story of A346. We went in unprepared with our, with our footwear. We were given some more footwear, inadequate, two or three weeks later. And by then it was too late. And I noticed from Barbara's, I think it's Barbara's um, um, notebook on the 346, if you want to check that for day-by-day -day record, I think it was the 18th of December, uh, Colonel Costello, regimental commander, was replaced. It doesn't say relieved. It says he was replaced. But you can maybe guess he was relieved because of the regiment that was in the worst shape and of the regiment, the company in the worst shape was A346. He may have been the one that got the brunt of it when the, the, the buck stops here. And there was a temporary replacement, I can't say his name, from the 35th Division. 35th Division was near as this colonel got moved over. And then after that, a gentleman that grew up 20 miles from me that I'd never met and still haven't, Donald Clayman, became regimental commander and served, I guess, very well to the end. So that's about it, but I can, let me get my socks out here. <laughs> One, one, one quick story, one quick story. Um, yeah, one quick story was, I guess it was our first or second day in, and my sergeant, Dick Norton, uh, was there beside me. I was the mortar, but he was our, our boss, and I'm carrying the, the mortar uh, yeah, barrel, the barrel, and the 88s are coming in. So we hit the ground together, and we get up, and then we could see one coming. I don't know this, you can see it kind of was going end over end, and it ended plop right between Dick and me. And of course it didn't explode. Well, I would still here. <laughs> but what happened was, uh, so it's time to go, so I got up. I said, come on, Dick, come on, we gotta go ahead. And he didn't get there, he said, and he told me later, I don't remember, he says, you picked up a hand of mud and threw it at me, and I got up and we went. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I don't know who else. There's another one of us on the graph. <laughs> no argument at all with what uh, Bob said, but I would just add that uh, what I remember was um, we replaced the 26, a part of the 26th division, and uh, they had had a lot of rain there, and and they had uh, footprints about this big, and they couldn't move well. I mean, every step they took was covered with mud. And uh, so they said to us, uh, throw away your galoshes. And we did. We were young, I, was, I just turned 19. They said, you throw them away, we threw them away. And we went into combat that way. And uh, I think I lasted a little longer than Bob, but I, I do remember, and I'm not a big candy eater, believe me, I'm not. But the next day, after we had our foot inspection, the next day we was going to have a, a candy ration. And I was so mad that they were going to relieve me before I could get the candy ration. I can't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, that's what happened. And then, uh, like Bob, I, I went back to England and spent uh, several weeks in the hospital with, with French foot. Yeah, let me, you know, that's interesting. I heard a lot of the guys in, uh, in my dad's outfit at the headquarters come and talk about how they had actually used the gloshers and put straw in them and not used the boots. Did any of you do that? Yeah, but that was, I don't know, but, but uh, one said that he, you know, he, I don't know if he lost his boots, they got so wet, but he just stuffed straw in his galoshers and wore those, he said, even all through the, most of the bones. I did. So I guess each regiment sort of Found did thing. different ones. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me tell a very brief uh, uh, frozen feet story. Um, 
We were assigned uh, in heavy weapons D345. We were assigned a, a little second lieutenant, a short guy, and he came up and they assigned him to the one of our two machine gun platoons. So he's in a foxhole with a tech sergeant uh, by the name of Willie Cohen. And um, some shells will fall again. So Lieutenant Bernard uh, turns to Willie Cohen, the sergeant, and says, take off the platoon, uh, Sergeant Cohen. I'm too afraid to move out of the hole. So that got back, and uh, the, uh, I think it was uh, the colonel, the lieutenant colonel, who heard about this, and they created a position for Lieutenant Bernard, battalion trench foot officer. And a battalion trench foot officer, since they were creating the position, they had to create the duties. The duties were, to go from company to company and ask the GRs to take off their shoes and they were supposed to feel their feet. Can you imagine? Can you? Don't imagine. It's hard to imagine that he would go from company to company, from platoon to platoon, and ask these guys to take off their stinking shoes while he inspected their feet. But that actually happened in D Company, 345th Infantry, in one of the most infamous chapters in military history. Uh, uh, 